my screen again. Yes, you should be able to share your screen. Okay, so I can go ahead. And you're, yeah, you're still the co-host. And welcome everybody. I'm going to turn it over to Anne so we can learn about the wonderful world of feathers. Okay. Well, hi everyone. Thanks for tuning in. This is supposed to be very interactive, so I'm hoping not to do all the talking. Um, but I would like to start with just talking about what really is a feather. So we're all on the same page. Feathers are made of keratin, which is a connective tissue made from protein. Um, there are two forms of keratin. There's an alpha keratin, which most vertebrates like ourselves have, our, our nails, our hair. And there's a beta carotene, which is more specific to birds. Um, so if we look at a feather, I want to point out the different parts of the feather. The center of the feather here that goes right up the middle is the rachis. And the bottom of that is the calamus. That would also be the quill. The whole part of the feather from sort of the top to the bottom where all these barbs are is the vein. And this is what's called a penaceous feather, meaning that it's hooked together. So I'm sure all of you have picked up a feather and been able to sort of unhook it and hook it back together. So that's penaceous down here where it's a little fluffier is the downy part, that's plumaceous. There's the plumaceous part. If you look a little closer at the anatomy, off of your rachis, you have the barbs. Bar barbs grow off of that. And off the barbs are the barbules. And on these barbules, you will see little hooks and they hook themselves together. So this is a blow up of the barbs and the barbules. And there you can see the hooklets. Um, and how does a feather grow? So part of the definition of a feather is that it starts and finishes in a follicle. But feathers really start um, as a little um, increase of cells in the dermis, right? So you get this little growth here called the placode. And as it starts to grow, there are actually two walls to the epidermal um, wall. And in those walls, the inner layer of the epidural cells is called the epidural collar. And the outer layer is, well, excuse me, then there's a middle layer too. And the middle layer is where you have the, um, a series of longitudinal ridges that create the barbs that I just talked about. And the Feather growth is very complicated, but to put it in layman's terms, the cells grow in a spiral fashion. So they're stacked kind of diagonally on top of each other. And so as the feather actually grows down, it's being pushed up by the follicle and out of the skin. And when it comes out, it has a sheath on it. And perhaps you guys have seen a feather with a sheath. If you've seen a bird that's molting or if you've seen a baby bird, they have the sheath on it and then the sheath degenerates and the blood supply is cut off and then the feather is finished. I didn't mean to do that, sorry. Um, and it's, um, let me go back to that, sorry. So when the feather is finished, there's no more blood, it's basically inert. If the bird loses a feather, there's what's called a sonic gene at the base of the follicle and it will kick right back into gear and grow another feather quickly because birds can't live long without their feathers. So I wanna stop there and see if there's any questions there. Anybody? Nope, all right. So let's go through some of the different types of feathers. You can basically split them into um, seven groups. There are the flight feathers. That first feather that I showed you was a flight feather because it was asymmetrical. The leaning edge is thinner and stiffer and that creates lift. Then you have the tail feathers, which are symmetrical to both sides of the vein or the rachis which was the center of the vein. 
The downy feathers do not have hooklets. Remember the hooklets were on the barbules, um, so they're not hooked together. Semi-plumes complement both the downy and the flight feathers. Bristles are found around the face and they work to protect the eyes and the nose. And then you have a phyloplume, which are really fascinating feathers that are teeny tiny. And they are at, found at the base of um, larger feathers. And they tell the birds when their feathers are out of place. And they also help the bird um, with their flight speed, locating where their feathers are. So if their feathers need to be shifted and cooling and heating to move their feathers. And they're attached to nerves unlike the other feathers, which are all attached to um, muscles or bone. So here's just another illustration of the different type of feathers. All right. So if we look at flight feathers, this is a flight feather that's highly notched, which is kind of cool. And you will see this type of feather on like an osprey or an owl, uh, not so much an owl, but an eagle. Um, where they can really spread out. Here's a flicker here, speaking of that feather, Rebecca. Um, and different, obviously different flight feathers work differently for different birds because of the type of flight that they need to have. So um, scientists always like to number everything. So if you're into numbering, you can see all your secondaries and your primaries and your coverts here, which lie on top. and these help to streamline the bird. They help for um, insulation um, and strength. But if you look at these two pictures here, the difference between a Cooper's Hawk flight and a white crowned sparrow's flight, very different. And so they have what's called a very different aspect ratio, which gets into the surface area of the bird and the length of their um, wings and the type of flight that they need to survive. So obviously a hawk is gonna glide to look for its food. So it needs a very large aspect ratio versus a white crowned sparrow, which is gonna be a seed eater, is gonna be darting away from these predators. It's gonna have a very small aspect ratio and a very different type of flight. And then their flight feathers will be um, shaped differently. So. So preening is super important. And I wanted to get into that before I get into too many other types of feathers because everybody used to think that um, preening was just from the uropigial gland at the base of their tail. But actually um, birds secrete what's called sebum from their skin. And there's 210 different types of genes that produce sebum that goes, that oozes out of their skin. So the birds will take their beak and they'll get a little bit of that um, preening oil on there and the secretions and they'll rub it through those barbs and those barbules to keep their flight feathers clean and moving nicely. Um, they can't afford to have their feathers break down and sunlight and bacteria are two of the biggest problems with feathers. So they clean, they preen ex excessively. Um, so when we think about all those different feathers, we have to think about keeping them healthy. So, um, oops, sorry. Are there any questions here? No? Okay. So, um, I can keep going through the different types of feathers. I can talk about colors. Um, anybody have any input? All right, I will keep going through the different type of feathers, which is gonna be down a little bit here because I was gonna move on to that. So hold on one moment. Good, could I ask you a quick question while you're paging through? Sure. So, so you had seven, I think, feather types. Yep. Does every bird have all seven or? Um, no, well, no, they don't. For instance, a penguin. Penguins have, and I can just pull that slide up. Penguins have super cool feathers <laughs> and they're very specialized. 
They don't fly, so they don't have flight feathers. Um, penguins have been studied extensively because it's pretty fascinating that they can live in the environment that they do and their feathers don't ice up. And why is that? Because they have these wrinkled and these grooved bar barbules and they have a very high density of downy feathers, okay? So they're not gonna have those alulas and um, the covert feathers. They're just gonna have a whole bunch of feathers that are gonna look like that. So they have their regular feather and then they have all these downy feathers that are at the base of their feathers and they're way more downy feathers than anybody really realized and the penguins. And they're studying this because the fact that they don't ice up with these grooved and wrinkled barbules, they're trying to mimic that to put on ships so that ships can go through ice without icing up. And they also want to be able to use it on airplanes. You know, they use those de-icers, but they're always trying to improve it. Um, so there's one example. And um, I'm trying to think. Nothing else pops into my brain. I think most other birds that are flying, well, like an emu and things like that, land birds that really aren't flying, aren't gonna have flight feathers, obviously. Um, but a lot of all, you know, your ducks, um, let me pull up that slide. And that's pretty interesting to talk about is contour feathers. So if we look at, oh, that's colors. If you think about why a feather, why ducks don't get wet, does everybody know about that? So if we go back to thinking about how those barbs and barbules connect, um, the different ways that they connect, they create air spaces. So different birds have different air spaces because they want different levels of being waterproof. So this um, wood duck, for instance, is a dabbling duck. It's not a diving duck. So it's gonna go under, but it's not gonna go way under. And so it has big air spaces. So water could not adhere to air. So essentially it rolls right off of them. Um, versus here's a cormorant and a cormorant needs to dive deep and fish. So they actually want their feathers to get wet. So they have um, smaller air spaces, tighter air spaces, because if they had to carry all of that um, air underwater, that would be too energy inefficient for them. That would just be, that'd be like trying to dive down with your life preserver on. Um, so then they'll come up and they'll dry their feathers and they'll open that up. Uh, and they, um, so that's pretty fascinating and Along with that, as far as air spaces, songbirds have very different air spaces also. They are somewhat waterproof, but you probably all have seen like a really wet cardinal or something like that. But they have very efficient downy feathers. Um, so if you know what a kinglet bird is, they're teeny tiny birds and they can overwinter in Maine and where it can get to, you know, 30 below. And these birds' internal temperature is 111. So that's a pretty huge temperature differentiation. And they can do that because they have really efficient down. And before the winter, they grow like 50% more feathers so that they can stay warm. So, all right. So, um, hey, and that's just sent you a little question for me yeah. about how do birds control their feathers and what type of control do they have? You mentioned that they were attached to muscles. And so they it, it just, if you could talk I about can that. elaborate on that, sure. So most feathers are um, attached to ligaments and bones with the exception of that phyloplume. And I was gonna go back to that slide. The phyloplume is that teeny tiny feather that attaches to the nerves and they um, help the bird adjust their feathers. So if the feathers are out of place, that phyloplume touches the nerve and sends a signal to the brain and the bird fixes their feathers. And so they can do that both on the ground and in flight. So I hope that answers that. 
So they can they can basically control each and every feather on their body. Yep. I have a quick question. Sure. The um when you were you were at the follicle stage where they with the dermis. Yep. It was coming up. How old is the um the featherless chick before uh, before that starts happening? When does that start happening on the chick or whatever? I forget what you call the. So call different birds are born differently. For instance, songbirds are born almost naked. Um, right. And so they're in the nest and those parents are with them all the time to keep them warm. Somebody's always sitting on them while the other one is hunting. And that takes a couple of weeks for those feathers to come in. Okay. Um, and again, it's different for pretty much each species, depending on how long they're in that nest. They need to, um, you know, it's all timed out very carefully and it's pretty much revolves around their food source. Okay. Um, but then you have a whole nother side like owls and eagles are born with a whole bunch of downy, um, they call it juvenile down. And it's really warm because those parents leave them, both leave them to go hunt. So they have to stay warm. They don't have somebody sitting on top of them. So they take longer. They're actually in there longer. Mm -hmm. um, and their feathers grow that much slower. I was trying to look for I have a really cute picture of an owl somewhere. Well, when the when the, the like you said, the songbird is born, you know, bald. Do the feathers start coming in all at once? You'll see little bumps all over the baby. Yep. And so the, so, so so basically all the little so the bumps will happen all at once. So they won't grow like you know haphazardly. They all happen uniformly. They do. They do. Okay. Um, and they um and they come out with that sheath on them so that's what i was talking about the sheath and then the sheath slowly degenerates so you'll see those they're called pin feathers mm -hmm. and so that takes a little while too okay. and, and birds will get that sheath also when they molt and some of them people ask me how long does it take for that sheath to go away I haven't found a good answer for that because again, different birds do it differently. Some of them need that sheath off right away because they've got to fly and get, you know, find food and survive. Others, it takes a little bit longer if they're able to hide away and mm -hmm. um, get their food source that way. Okay, thank you. Sure, yeah. So I didn't find my picture of the owl. Is this? No, nope, that's a loon. So I would love to talk a little bit about feather colors, if people are interested in that, because that's pretty fascinating. Um, feather colors are super interesting and quite complicated. And I'm really gonna be scratching the surface because um, uh, scientists spend their entire career working on feather colors. They start with dinosaurs and they go all the way up. Um, there's basically three different ways or four different ways that birds get um, color in their, in their feathers. There's pigments, and these are a bunch of the different pigments, and I'll go through a couple of them. There's light refraction and feather structure, which creates the blues, violets, and some greens. And then there's a combination of both, and then there's iridescence. So um, if we think about melanins, which are same thing like in our skin. Birds produce melanins from um, protein that they have and they show up as black, gray, browns. They tend to be the strongest feather and they protect the feathers from sunlight. Um, so even though a bird has a blue feather, there's melanin in that. So just hold on to that thought for a minute because I'm gonna go through a couple more of those pigments. Then there's carotenoid pigments, and these come from their diet. They're made from plants, fungi, bacteria, and they're, they strengthen the feathers, the eyes, and the gametes. So these birds are all seed-eating birds. They're getting their carotenoids from seeds. They can also get it secondhand. If you think about, everybody wants to say that flamingos get their color from what they eat. Well, they do, but if a flamingo is eating more algae, then shrimp, 
it's going to have a darker colored pink because the carotenoids are made from plants and fungi. They're not made from the shrimp. The shrimp can't produce those, but the shrimp eats the algae and then the flamingo eats the shrimp. <laughs> so if you follow me, if they're, eating, get, if they're getting more algae, they're gonna be darker pink than if they're getting more shrimp, they're gonna be lighter. And that's pretty much true for all these songbirds too. So if you see a cardinal that's really bright red, he's pretty healthy, he's getting what he needs. And um, there have been studies done about how they think that these carotenoid pigments create a positive feedback loop. So you eat your carotenoids, you have this bright red color, which makes you a fitter bird, a more beautiful bird. Perhaps you're gonna get chosen for a mate because you look like you're healthy, you're preening well. Um, you get chosen for a mate, then your gametes are protected by these carotenoids. So your offspring will have better eyes, better gametes, stronger feathers, so it goes on like that. So it's a bit of survival of the fittest that way. Um, so light reflection comes from the structure of feathers and a combination of pigments. So blue is not actually a color in nature, it's all a structure. So if you find a bluebird feather or a blue jay feather, and, and it's always fun to do this when you're in person, I can pass it around, but um, you can look at it in the light and you can see it changes color a little bit because it's really melanin underneath a different structure. And then the way the light hits it and refracts, you're seeing blue. And so you can, just like the color wheel, you can get these all different melanins reacting with different structures. So the scientists study those different, um, those different structures and the different melanins. And melanins are made from what's called melanosomes, which are intercellular organelles. And they come in all different sizes and shapes, depending on what color they're trying to produce. So, Remember I said melanin is the strongest feather. So there's melanin in these feathers. And here is a slide of different melanosomes, which shows different ones. So if you looked at the, um, the throat of a hummingbird, a ruby-throated hummingbird, and you see it from different angles, it's gonna look different. A lot of times when you see a hummingbird fly, it just looks black or it looks dark and then it, you catch a certain angle and you see that iridescence. So here's part of the structure color. There's melanosomes in there. But then if you get even deeper looking at that iridescence, iridescence that creates, the cells create this matrix. It's a really complicated matrix and they're stacked in different ways and different thicknesses. So when the light hits it at different angles, it creates a different color. You're starting to see how complicated <laughs> color is. It's a lot of layers. It's so interesting though. So um and do the yeah. birds do the birds know what color they are? <laughs> I mean I, I that I, meaning is it does it um is there a benefit? I mean, for the iridescent color, if they're if they move in one direction, they can make themselves black looking, and that they can move themselves in another direction, they could maybe seen by a predator. Um, I don't I don't know if that's if that's something that's taken into behavior or not. So yes, because obviously you know the male um, uh, hummingbird is going to have this bright throat that he can flash at his potential mate, and then he can move away and it looks dark and he can hide himself. Um, so that definitely plays into it. But birds do see a whole nother realm of feathers, of, of colors that we don't see. They see ultraviolet, which we can't see. So then you can get into, they're seeing it differently from what we're seeing it, but they're definitely seeing the brightness and they're gonna see more depth. And that also, you can start to talk about the evolution of flowers and how flowers have, you know, grown to attract different birds with these colors. And there's actually videos and stuff that you can look up that shows what a bird sees 
I mean, you've probably seen it with bees too, what, and how they're going to those um, plants, which is really cool. So, but again, they have to work to keep themselves very clean and healthy all the time by preening. And there's another way they can do that, which I think is pretty interesting is the, the common house finch has that red color. And I have a slide here somewhere for that. Um, they, have, they do what's called cosmetic coloration. So in the breeding season, the male will preen himself. Here it is. Preens himself and his sebum changes a little bit. Remember, that's the oil that comes from the skin and it enhances his color. So he's dressing up for his girlfriend um, by coloring himself. So, and then this will, his sebum will change again when it's not the breeding season. So it will go, you know, back to a little more bland. Um, and here's the, here's the iridescent slide. So, and they're the weakest feathers. So they're, they're really so intense and very, very complicated. But again, here's the flight feathers with the melanin in them. Yep, just a little bit of iridescence on the top to make them strong. And here's another type of um, pigment, piscata fluvoids, which are found in parrots. They create these vivid colors and they have antibacterial and antifungal properties, which is pretty interesting. So if you think about where parrots live, it's always humid and damp, and there's a lot of bacteria. There's a lot of bacteria in feathers anyways, very similar to our body. Birds carry a, a certain ratio or population of bacteria. Some of it's harmful, some of it's helpful. If it gets out of balance, their feathers are gonna um, degenerate, and that's, you know, a huge problem. They're not going to be able to fly, et cetera, et cetera. So there have been a lot of studies done on bacteria, and one of which I think is really fascinating is with the eastern bluebirds, because we see them a lot. There's a bacteria that's in almost all birds that touch the ground, bacteria luciniformis, bactillus luciniformis. Anyways, it's a ground a ground bacteria. So anytime a bird goes down on the ground, they're going to pick up a little bit of this bacteria. And it's a feather degenerating bacteria. So they have to keep this bacteria in check. They don't get rid of it all. That would be too, in a, that would be too costly for them, but they just keep it in check. I guess it's like us washing our hands. But they've done studies that show that the male eastern bluebird can tolerate very high levels of this bacteria, and they even think it enhances his color, and the female cannot. And so why is that? They're trying to figure that out. They don't know. But now they're taking the study of bacteria all the way back to the dinosaurs and trying to see how bacteria populations can have effects on bird colors and, and feather health. So that's pretty cool. That's interesting to me. So, any other questions? I can do more about feathers. I mean, I'm more about colors. I can talk a little bit about the research that's being done with feathers, which is pretty fascinating. Shall I go there, Bronwyn? Well, let's see. Anybody have a, this is supposed to be very interactive and trying to answer some of the questions that you have with about feathers. One thing I know that um might be interesting to folks if they are out and about in nature and they find a feather are they allowed to pick it up yeah we should go through that so the migratory bird treaty act um was one of audubon's big accomplishments it was passed in 1918 and it really said it was evolved from the snowy egret you probably all remember these ladies with fancy um feathers in their hat, right? Well, lots of birds were being killed because of those feathers. Ostriches were a huge, huge deal with that. Um, when the Titanic sank in, I think it was 19, 1912, there was $2.3 million worth of feathers on the Titanic. Um, so because of that, <laughs> they stopped people using feathers. Um, World War II, sorry about my dogs, World War um, I came, 
and everybody was in these Ford T model cars with open um, that were um, convertibles you couldn't wear those fancy hats anymore and people had to go and go to work for the war so that helped end it so because of that this migratory bird treaty act that you are not allowed to pick up any feathers unless it's a game bird if it's a bird that you can hunt like a wild turkey or different ducks in hunting season um, or geese you can pick those feathers up, but any other feathers you are not allowed to pick up, just like you're not allowed to touch bird nests. So they made that all off limits to save all these birds that were being exploited. You can pick up feathers if you have a license. If you find a um, bald eagle feather, there's actually a a uh, $5,000 fine if you are find, found keeping that feather. What you should do if you find a dead bald eagle or a bald eagle feather is you should contact the U.S. Fish and Wildlife um, Service and you send that feather to them and there's a whole bunch of Native American tribes that are kind of in line to receive those feathers and they distribute them so that they can use them for their cultural activities. So yeah, don't just go picking up feathers. Plus a lot of birds, especially in the springtime, use feathers to line their nests. So they're gathering feathers that other birds have discarded, molted, and that's super important. Like a tree swallow, I, there was a study done where they counted like 90 feathers in the um, nest of that tree swallow. And there's been studies again, getting back to the bacteria, why does the tree swallow, swallow put those feathers in there? And they seem to like white feathers too. And so they're studying the bacteria and there's been benefits of the bacteria in that, in those feathers for the eggs. Are they, are they looking at antibacterial properties of feathers and able to use those for human, re human sources? I don't know about how it's translated to human resources. That I don't know. Yeah, can't answer that question. But um, there is a great book called The Nesting Season by Bern Heinrich. And he um, really gets in depth of birds and their nesting and their mating and how they build their nests and lots about feathers too. Um, and a lot of birds will pull, um, a lot of ducks will actually pull their downy feathers out to line their nests that way and they actually create um, I'm sure a lot of you are mothers out there and when you had your baby they said skin on skin was so important well birds will um, pre well they'll pull out the feathers and they'll create what's called a brood hatch and it's a bare spot on their belly <laughs> so their babies are on that bare spot with the feathers around it so that just always reminded me of skin on skin um, so this is, you can see that Anne has a lot of different slides and what she was trying to do is be able to take questions and then move into her different parts of the presentation to kind of uh, complement those answers. So we really want to have some, some back and forth from folks if there's anything about feathers. No question is too crazy. Just throw it out there and what do you want to learn about feathers? <clears throat> And I was hoping that, <clears throat> this is Adrian, I was hoping that you would cover development of feathers through um, the paleontology record. Okay. You yep. know, from yep. way back when. I can do that. Yeah. But I don't want to derail your talk. No, no, there was, you I, you know, it in it. it's all good. I'm happy to do that. I, um, was planning to skip around to try to um, accommodate people in what they wanted to hear and not go into other stuff that they didn't want to hear. So what I want to do is get to my thing of that, which is going to be way down here. So I can start by saying that um, this guy is the big feather guy. <laughs> Dr. Richard Prum, he, he's published more on feather colors and evolution of feathers um, than anybody else I can find. He, the first feathers really appear in the evolution about, well, 
we thought 230 million years ago, but now we found they're closer to 260 million years ago. Um, and he has produced a feather theory, which that feathers evolve in stages. So they start as like a hollow branch, and then there's a bundle of branches, and then they're a little bit hooked together, and then they're more hooked together, and eventually they're asymmetrical like our flight feather. So he's worked with a um, Asian man named Jing Zhu, who has found a lot of these um, fossils in the, I can't really pronounce this, Liaoning province. It's a hot, and feather hunting right now is a hot topic because of the electron microscope and what they found out about the color and the melanosomes. Um, there's a lot out there. So this was one of the first ones, the Cinerceropteryx. I don't think I said that right, sorry. <laughs> Anyways, um, these are stage one feathers. So these, they always thought this was fuzz, but actually they've decided that they're feathers. Um, because they have the melanosomes, they're different from collagen. They, um, so this proves from initial one, initial th um, thing. Then you can move on to stage two and three, and the two of them described these two fossils. So you don't have flight feathers. You can see their wings are really short, but they're hooked together. And then you can get into Microraptor, which is such a cool fossil, I think. So this was sort of known as the the leaping um, dinosaur, and it's complicated. To there's a whole big, you know, controversy of whether birds flew by leaping or running and jumping. But I think that the most accepted um, theory now is that they would jump from tree to tree. So this was considered the four winged dino because um, he had them on both legs and arms. Um, I also like to talk about this one though, because this was considered the oldest dinosaur with feathers. And he was named for Dr. Huxley, who first suggested in the 1860s, the dinosaurs were more, um, more closely related to warm blooded birds than the reptiles. Because the original theory with feathers that this was that they were scales and that then, then there was a genetic shift. And so instead of the scales growing sideways, they grew up. But that's pretty much been tossed aside. And now they've just come out with these. They're, this is pretty accepted, what Dr. Prum has said, and he's still working on it. Um, and if you go back to this, these stages, Modern birds have these hollow, um, very simple feathers as seen in like rectal bristles that you see on night jars and stuff that used to be, they're like here, turkeys, they're very well developed in turkeys too. And they used to think that they would funnel insects in, but now they think that they are actually to protect the beak and the eyes. So it's pretty similar to these very, old feathers. So I hope that's kind of the short version of it. I hope that helps, Adrian. Yeah. Anything else on that? Where should we go now, group? Who has the next feather topic that we should delve into? Hmm. No, well, I can talk about... If um, feather hunting is so um, hot, I just still don't understand it's, if it's illegal to pick up a feather, how do you hunt? And well, collect? you can get a license. You can apply to get a license. Okay. I applied to get a license, said that I was giving this talk, said that I was only going to pick up feathers in the fall, and they said, nope. And then, um, this was like four years ago when I started really studying them, and then they said I could get it through another organization if the organization was going to sponsor me. And it was a lot of hoops for the organization to jump through. So actually, I just, you know what, it's best to just take pictures. Um, and I have a good friend that does have a license, so she will send me some feathers that are extra. And I can study them that way, too. So um, 
the the one thing that's pretty fascinating that most people enjoy too is um this guy is pepper trail who's <laughs> criminal forensic ornithologist. And he's probably retired now, probably retired this year, but he's trained someone else to do this. And he works out in Washington and he gets sent all kinds of bits of feathers. And essentially he's looking for evidence. He's trying to solve crimes for people. So for instance, there was a murder crime where he was sent a downy feather and he was able to determine that the downy feather was from an eider down was eider down from an eider duck versus a chicken feather. So that means that the perpetrator had a expensive down jacket on because he had eider down in his jacket, not chicken poultry down in his jacket. So he does a lot of, um, a lot of um, uh, court work. And here, and he's international too. So he's helping South African delegates deal with black market trafficking. So he's probably identifying what kind of bird this is that they found. Um, and there's research being done now with um, different devices. They look at the isotopes, the stable isotopes in feathers, and they can determine where those feathers were grown. And they can also determine what the bird was eating. So in certain areas of the world, a lot of birds are sold and they're trying to be passed off as legally selling these birds because you can breed some exotic breeds in, you can breed them domestically and sell them. But a lot of people catch them in the wild and sell them and try to pretend that they've, you know, raised this bird. So now they can look at the feathers of those birds and know that that bird has been eating a domestic diet or a wild diet. And if it was eating a wild diet, they can nail that person, which is a huge deal for conservation, huge. And along those same lines, how else are they using, let's say current modern technology to go back into collections like we have at the Natural History Society? And what kind of data could we pull out from there that could be helpful moving forward? So the one, that's a tough one because I need to read more about what's going on with the, um, with the bacteria that I've just started. And that's, it's not that new, but I don't know too much about that. The electron microscope is a huge deal um, as far as looking at the colors of these prehistoric birds and seeing how the different colors they can interact with their environment differently than what they thought they were doing. And I should point out too, which I forgot to point out, which was remiss of me, is that feathers did not start for flight. Feathers first came on the picture for social signaling and insulation. Flight came long after that, which again, Dr. Prum's theory shows that, but everybody wants to know about flight. So feathers were on the scene way before flight came in. And again, the, the ecological, the evolutionary record is all over the place. You know, there's not a straight funnel. There's all sorts of different things that come up and go away as far as feather structure and color. Um, so I don't know, Brian. <laughs> I don't know how that could help you in your thing. I think it's really cool though to look at, and she did this, Carla Dove, and that's what I was telling Rebecca in the beginning. She wrote this booklet that you can download and it's the microscopy of feathers. And so that if you wanna look at an old feather and you can look at some of that downy feather, you can see some of these microscopic structures that feathers have. Um, and determine where they came from. And so they are still looking at, at those, which is pretty fascinating. She works in the Smithsonian Museum in DC, and she really works primarily for the FAA and the Navy and Air Force. Anytime there's an airstrike, and meaning a bird has struck into an engine of an airplane, she gets sent these little bits of feathers, she actually calls them snarge. <laughs> and so she has to look through her collection and figure out what they are. And sometimes they're so messed up and stuff, she has to look 
in the microscope and she can see these different um, characteristics of feathers to try to understand what kind of bird it was. She tries to look first in the collections and see it that way, but if she can't, she'll look the other way. So um, she's the one that developed that book and that would be really fun to do with kids. I think if they're interested in looking at the microscope, if you could get some feathers and you can look at duck feathers and you know, you can get some songbird feathers, look at them and then put them back. <laughs> and, and, and you mentioned the, the, the perpetrator was caught because he was wearing an expensive down jacket. What, how, you know, and feathers that were used by, by people for fashion, I, I'm assuming that we don't do that very much anymore. Well, they do, <laughs> but the feathers are grown legally. They're legally sourced feathers. So you can get in touch with a, somebody who has turkeys. You can get turkey feathers. You can get poultry feathers, obviously. You can get duck feathers from duck hunters and you can dye them all different colors and create all these crazy feathers. So you still do see hats with feathers that are dyed and um, I'm always looking really carefully to see <laughs> if I can figure out what kind of feather that is when I see one. Um, but yeah, and actually there's a really cool book. I don't know if anybody's heard of The Feather Thief and there was a podcast done on it too. And it's the story of a young guy that steals an entire collection of feathers out of a museum in England. And it gets tied into, no pun intended, to the whole fly, tishing, fly fishing and making these um, flies that they use for fishing because they want all these ornamental, crazy colored flies to um, feathers to try to represent the flies that they're making. And that's a great book. If anybody's looking for a good read, it's all true. <laughs> well, how are the feathers sourced for their down pillows? And, and is, are those just chicken feathers or? Those are chicken feathers, and that's a huge deal because, as you know, as Americans and actually all over the world, we eat a whole lot of chicken, right? So there's a whole lot of feathers left over. And the um, I met this guy, I don't think I still have this slide, like three years ago, who was tasked with the um, job to figure out um, he worked for the agriculture department in DC, what to do with all the excess poultry feathers that are created. I can't remember exactly, but I think we produce 20,000 tons of feathers like in a month or something. It's crazy. So he actually figured out how to make a machine that stripped off the barbs from the rachis and, and mush them down. And he was able to make all kinds of um, stuff out of these feathers that essentially could replace plastics. Um, he was able to make like netting that would go in Africa, that would go over um, families to prevent um, malaria. And they can put the insecticides in that and the, um, they could use less insecticides because the feathers are very absorbent and could hold it. Um, he came up with all kinds of things. He came up with this material that could be pretty hard and essentially replace plastics. And he almost had Tyson and Purdue um, buy into the whole thing and then they backed out of it because it's cheaper to make plastic with petroleum than it is with feathers. It's a pretty dirty, process to clean the feathers it's pretty it gets kind of expensive but it's the one thing that he told me which I thought was so cool is that when there's an oil um, spill you know those big booms that they put out to try to hold the um, oil in a certain area those could be made out of feathers and then you're not pollute I mean if they sunk to the bottom it would just be extra protein you know, and if you, you could make kids toys out of protein, if they left them on the beach, it would just be extra protein that would eventually disintegrate and not hurt things. And he's worked really hard to make, and he gave me one, I don't think I have it here, a flower pot that's made out of feathers. <laughs> so 
so you would these would go to the, all the big nurseries so you would go and buy your plants in the spring and plant your plants with this plant into the ground and it would disintegrate and there's extra um it's just protein it's just the keratin that's been processed into this thing um this material it looks like plastic it feels like plastic but it doesn't have all the downsides of plastic so he hasn't really He's working on it still, but it's, again, it's just, it's a, it's a business model that's not right there. So, pretty interesting. That is. Does anybody have any other questions about feathers? Anything at all? This is your opportunity. <laughs> All right, then we're hitting our seven or eight o'clock hour mark. And I want to thank um, Anne for sharing her expertise with us. Um, as always, I, I go to bed on Thursday night with a little bit of a bigger brain than I had when I woke up this morning. So I appreciate that. And I appreciate all of you for spending your time with us at the Natural History Society of Maryland. And I hope to see you at one of our upcoming programs. Remember, we have a couple of uh, the fossil uh, program coming up as well as the projectile points. So take a look at our website, which is www.marylandnature.org and see all of the wonderful things that are going on. And we hope to see you in person really, 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 really soon. Um, so we have all of our fingers, our washed hands, fingers uh, crossed uh, to that effect. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for tuning thank in. You, thank you. Very and interesting. And Walker, can I ask you one more question? Sure. So just as a casual observation, right? Yep. Seems to be an incredible drop off in insects. Yes. Can you trace that into feathers or if, if the birds have fewer insects, are you seeing a difference in feather, whatever, morphology? Because uh, the protein, yeah, that's a pretty fascinating thing. I don't, that would be really interesting to look into because you know they are doing, um, they are, instead of taking blood from um, birds now to do research, they are plucking a feather, again, to look at those isotopes. So if the bird has a stressful situation, they will have a, it's called a fault bar that shows up in the feather and it's a disruption of the feather growth. And they've looked at those and they've been able to trace back big weather events that have occurred mm -hmm. and birds were growing those feathers during those weather events. So I'm just hypothesizing that perhaps we're gonna see some of that in the future if they're not getting the protein from these insects that they need in certain times of the year, maybe they're gonna grow their feathers differently or there's gonna be more fault bars. But that's, I'm hypothesizing, but maybe. See, I just gave you something to write a grant on. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that, that's pretty interesting. I know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, I, you gave a talk for the Fossil Club and Natural History. Oh, that's the Adrian that gave me the fossil. Adrian, yeah? That's me. Oh, right. thanks. <laughs> but I still learned something from this talk. So okay. I'd, be, I'd be more than happy to, uh, to attend and hear it again a third and fourth time. Oh, you're so yeah, sweet. Thank you. Something new. Thank you. Well, I love feathers. They're pretty fascinating. Nobody has anything quite like them. <laughs> well, and so, so one of these days, we still need to get together. Absolutely. And yep. uh, rummage an entire collection of, of fossil feathers. Yes, I would love to. Cool. Okay. Thank I mean, you. Thank you very much. All right. Take care, everybody. Thanks for coming. Okay. Thank, you. Bye -bye. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Anne. That was wonderful. Oh, I hope so. That was really fun to do it that way, just a little bit more spontaneous. I hope there was no. a, yeah.
I think that I, I enjoy that, that kind of, um, uh, yeah. format, you know, because yeah. everybody comes to this, comes to the topic from a different place and, and they have different and it. And it, I think it's kind of interesting, the different directions and places that you can go through it. So, yes. Yep. I agree. I agree. Well, thank you. I'm going to send you some money too. Oh, <laughs> buy a raffle ticket. I am. I am. The, me, like all my favorite places are struggling. I'm like, I'm going to send them some money. Yeah. Do the escape room. It's a good challenge. Yeah, that sounds cool. <laughs> <laughs> and join us for something else on the Thursday Thursday evening. Some of our I will. There's some good ones coming up that I would really like to do. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right, and take care. You too. See ya. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.